I'm Matt Morrow and this is Colorado Point of View. It's a jam packed week with Colorado in the spotlight of the race for the White House and now it's getting personal between a former president and the governor. It all started with this video that shows armed men breaking into an apartment in Aurora along with now debunked claims of Venezuelan gangs taking over the entire city. Aurora police now tell us they've identified these men and are trying to hunt them down and have no evidence to show that the men you see here are part of the infamous Tren de Aragua gang. But that's not stopping former President Donald Trump and others from pushing that false narrative about violence in Aurora and Colorado in general. Mr. Trump continues to claim if he's elected, he'll order widespread deportations, but has not explained how that might happen. He's also said he'll visit Aurora, but is yet to do so. And the city says it knows of no official plans. And new this week, Donald Trump is calling out Colorado Governor Jared Polis, saying he doesn't know what the heck is going on here. Earlier this week, the governor joined me to talk about all of that, housing, and more. Governor Polis, thanks so much for being here today. I appreciate it. There was a lot to talk about. Colorado, specifically Aurora, continues to be in a national spotlight when it comes to immigration, crime, and gang violence. It's also at the center of a lot of disinformation and really some outright lies. First, former President Donald Trump has talked a lot about these issues on the campaign trail. And again this week, he brought you into it. Listen. Do you see what's happening in Aurora? In Colorado, the mayor is petrified. He, he doesn't, I mean, he's petrified, but the governor is a mess. He's, he doesn't know what the hell is. He's a Democrat liberal, and uh, they're taking over real estate, lots of real estate. The governor doesn't know what to do. All right, there's a lot to <laughs> unpack right there. Well, I mean, I, he said that, that Mayor Mike Coffin is terrified of his own city, and we don't, look, Aurora's a terrific city. I love Aurora. It's a great city. I, you know, I go there with my family all the time. It's got some of the ba best ethnic food in our state, you know, Ethiopian, Korean. Uh, we love going to H Mart there. Um, it's got fun stores, restaurants, recreation. Uh, Aurora's terrific, right? I mean, it's um, like any big city, and this is the third biggest city in Colorado. Of course, it has its problems, but it's definitely uh, a safer place, crime down two years in a row. Uh, and, you know, I remember growing up, I mean, you know, in the 90s, Aurora was a little more sketchy than it is now, for sure. I mean, I think it's really turned the corner and become a major, uh, major great city, a great place to live, great place to raise a family. You know, hopefully if the president does visit, although he often doesn't keep his word, he said he was going to visit, you know, but just he says things that aren't to the former president. But if he does visit, yeah, you know, we'll play some golf there. He'll enjoy our restaurants. He'll uh, have a great time in Aurora. So you invite former President Donald Trump well, he to He invited come to himself. Aurora. He said he was coming. Again, I don't, I don't know if he was telling the truth. He usually doesn't. So, But if we see him, we see him, and uh, we'll show him a good time. When you talk about the issue of crime, you're right. Crime is down in Aurora. Two years in a row. Both violent crime and property crime. It's down in Denver as well, yes. that has, city that has accepted more than 40,000 migrants from the southern border. And it's down all across Colorado. Again, we're talking violent crime, property crime, you name it. But there is this perception, in part because of some videos that have been released and they've been shown all across the national news, that there is a crime issue and a gang issue in Aurora. So how do you sort of counter that? Well, I think, uh, you know, depending on what videos you might have seen, at least in the ones that I saw, the people have been apprehended and they've already been charged with crime. So, uh, I, you know, and again, I, I think that uh, the fact that those uh, existed and were part of the evidence used to convict people is a good thing. Uh, but uh, overall, Aurora is a safer city than it was. And I think uh, the mayor is absolutely not terrified of his own city. I don't usually speak for Mike Hoffman, but I can with confidence tell you that the mayor's not scared of his own city and uh, nobody should be. It's a great city. Aurora is terrific. I love Aurora. Do you think the mayor and some others in the city should have gotten on top of this issue faster? There's been some who say they've sort of fueled the fire talking about, OK, there are these gang issues. There's a video at the apartment complexes and all. And at first, they really didn't dispel some of the myths. Well, it is strange to see how this kind of went from this you know, right wing ecosystem into the mainstream. Uh, it's not good for the reputation of Aurora. And it'll take a lot of hard work from Mayor Coffin, and I've let him know that we're right alongside him, the city council, to help make sure that Aurora has the reputation it deserves. It's a terrific place to live, to grow a business, to raise a family, to retire. Uh, and I, I hope that the city council gets on that same page of being boosters for the city that they serve and, and helping Aurora rightfully take its place alongside 
Colorado Springs is in Denver as one of Colorado's great cities. Back in 2019, you signed a bill into law that, among some other things, made it illegal for local law enforcement to arrest or detain people based on their immigration status or to even sort of notify ICE if they are here illegally. When it comes to some of these gang members who are in the country illegally or, and are causing problems in Aurora, should police there be able to call ICE and say, we have these people in custody, please come and get them? Absolutely. We work closely with ICE on criminal enforcement, as do all of our police departments, all of our sheriff's departments. Uh, that law applies to non-criminal matters. So on non-criminal matters, uh, they're not reported to the federal agencies on anything that's a criminal matter. There is full cooperation between Colorado law enforcement, uh, local law enforcement, ICE, FBI, and other federal partners that are involved with helping to keep Colorado safe. So if someone's a violent criminal but accused of violent crimes, even, local even police can crime. call ICE. Even a nonviolent crime, any criminal activity, uh, we coordinate closely with our federal partners. And we want to make sure if somebody commits a crime in Colorado, if they're here illegally, that they're promptly deported and held accountable to the law. When you look at the perception versus reality of this, do you think the issue could hurt Democrats nationally and those here in Colorado, say Congresswoman Yadira Caraveo, who's in a really tight race against Gabe Evans? Well, I think Democrats nationally have really taken the offense on this, saying, look, we're willing to we want to work with Republicans to secure the border and stop the flow of illegal immigrants. There was a very strong bipartisan border security bill. It funded border enforcement. It, it had quicker uh, processing to make sure that people were, 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 were kicked out who shouldn't be here. It funded Border Patrol with technology and people uh, and it had Republican and Democratic support. But it was killed by Donald Trump, who said basically he wanted to keep this as a political issue rather than solve it. So uh, I think people know that if they truly value securing the border, they need to give Democrats the opportunity to do that with Kamala Harris and a Democratic Congress. Have you talked about this issue of migrants, crime, and this perception versus reality with uh, your colleague, Ohio Governor DeWine? Haven't talked to him recently about it, but they're struggling with the same things there. Uh, just as bizarre as the false accusations at Aurora, they're talking about immigrants, you know, consuming pets and animals, no truth to it, uh, not good for the reputation of Ohio, and obviously offensive to members of the Haitian American community. Uh, so uh, again, they're facing some of the same things that we face. We shouldn't have a president that attacks his own country. Uh, and I think that's the, the, the challenge we have. I know that Kamala Harris and Tim Walls will be president and vice president for the entire country and, and really boost our entire country, just as I do as governor. I, I do my best to boost our entire state because it's a great state and I love it. Uh, and even if there was a little part of it that I, for some reason, I had a problem with, I keep it to myself and I still talk about how great it was every day of the week. One of the big issues for people here and across the country is housing, the cost of housing, basically the cost of everything. CNBC recently ranked states based on how expensive they are to live in. Colorado was tied for fifth. The state is spending millions of dollars. You've signed a number of bills over the last few years to help invest in affordable housing. You look at the economy, inflation's cooling down. You see interest rates are going down a little bit. Markets are at an all-time high, but so many people still say, I still am getting pinched every single week. I can barely afford everything. What else can you do, can Colorado do, to make everyday life more affordable for this people This has been here? the big focus of my efforts over the last two years because, look, um, like anything, the pricing of housing is subject to supply and demand. Demand is high for housing because Colorado is a great place to live. Aurora is a great place to live. People want to move there. Denver, Colorado Springs, our suburbs, our exurbs, our rural areas. People want to live in Colorado. They love it. Uh, but on the supply side, we've restricted artificially the supply of housing by making it very hard and having too many regulations around building housing. We're cutting through those. So we've eliminated a lot of costly requirements and paperwork to make it easier to build housing, especially near job centers. Uh, and we want to continue that work with the legislature to make it easier to build new homes in Colorado to reduce prices. When will people see some of that? When will this take effect and we'll see like this boom of housing and therefore it'll actually potentially, I think the goal is to lower the price. I think you're already starting to see it, right? I think it's easier. If you're in the market for a home, you'll have an easier time now than you might have a year or two ago, but not an easy enough time. And I totally get that. What we especially want to do is make it easier to build two, $300,000 homes, starter homes that people can own, uh, young couples, people buying for the first time. Because we know that that six, $700,000 level, even five, is really hard for people to get in. You often need to get a $250,000 home, build equity, maybe 10, 15 years later, you can't afford that $600,000 home, but we just have very little 
of that inventory on the market. And, and in fact, it's often been the hardest to build. The most red tape and regulations and rules that prevent these two $300,000 homes from being built, and that's what we're getting, we're cheating to get rid of. One of the things you've talked about with making things more affordable for people is to potentially one day down the road eliminate a state income tax. You've lowered it a little bit. Voters have as well over the past few years. Do you see any more of that lowering of the state income tax in the next two years? Well, since governor? I've been governor, we've cut the income tax three times. Twice the voters at the ballot box, I supported it, both both of them, once through the legislature bipartisan bill uh, that reduces the income tax. So it was 4.63%. Right now it's 4.25%. So that's a that's a significant savings for people. That's almost half a percent that it's come down. And of course, we're always willing to roll up our sleeves and find, find ways to reduce it more. We just did some polling in the 8th Congressional District, a very diverse district, goes from just north of the metro up to Greeley. One question we asked people is, how confident are you that Colorado's elections are safe and secure? You see the results right here. Almost a third in this district say they are not too confident or not confident at all. As we get close to an election year, this has been a big topic that's been talked about on the campaign trail. What do you say to voters who are concerned or maybe worried about Colorado's election system? Colorado has one of the best election integrity systems in the country. From the county clerks uh, up to the secretary of state, uh, paper ballots, uh, requirements in terms of registration, uh, able to verify uh, voting. In fact, you can even check online whether your ballot's been received. Uh, and, and, and make sure it has been. If it wasn't received, if it gets lost, you can still go in and cast your vote on Election Day. Uh, so I'm proud of what Colorado is by many of the national organizations that objectively evaluate uh, this work. Uh, we have one of the best systems in the country to make sure that voting is safe and secure. No concerns from you. Uh, we have the, we have among the best right here in Colorado, and I can assure my fellow Coloradans that uh, our votes will be counted accurately and fairly. Finally, I know you're a big sports fan. Talk about CU doing well this year. The Denver Broncos have the owners of the Broncos talk with you about the idea of building a new stadium and asking for some support from the state. Well, I, you know, I've certainly made it clear that we're excited to have the color, the Denver Broncos here in Denver, and we want to work with the team however we can. And and I think uh, if we can get when we get a winning team this year and, and, and show that we can do it, uh, that'll build even more goodwill around working with the organization uh, to help make sure we can provide the very best experience for the fans. So would you offer them anything if they want to build a new stadium in terms of a tax break or something along those lines? Well, I, I, you know, again, I haven't, I am not aware of any of those discussions about the tax breaks. I think a lot of that is always at the local level with the uh, city of Denver. But um, like anybody, you know, we have a stadium district that has the current site. Uh, we work with the, the, the uh, Colorado Rockies as well. And in Colorado, we're a uh, athletic state. We're proud to have uh, top professional teams in major sports. There's now a bid underway to attract women's soccer to Colorado, which I'm very supportive as well, uh, as well as a bid to attract the gay games to Colorado. Um, so we're, we're not only a place where people like watching sports, but we're also a state where people like participating in sports. And one of the statistics about Colorado that I'm proud of is we have the lowest obesity rate of any state. Right, Colorado Governor Jared Polis. Governor, it's good to see you. Thanks Likewise. so much for being here. I Take appreciate care. it. Stick around. New poll results are in for one of the country's tightest congressional races, and it's right here in Colorado. Plus, new reaction to the so-called civil nice VP debate and more. Stay right there. We are back here on Colorado Point of View, and I'm joined by these gentlemen, Democratic strategist and senior presidential and gubernatorial advisor Andy Boyan, and Republican strategist and the president of Advanced Colorado, Michael Fields. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. you A lot to get to, as always. Let's get right to it. I want to start with the results of our brand new public poll in the 8th Congressional District, Fox 31, Channel 2, and Emerson College did the polling here. You've had a few days to digest this. Take a look at it again. For all intents and purposes, it is a dead heat. The challenger, Republican State Representative Gabe Evans, leads the incumbent Democrat Congresswoman Yadira Carabello by 0.2%. That is it. It's also well within what is basically the margin of error here of 4.2%. It's not entirely surprising given how close this race was two years ago, 1,632 votes, and how the district is drawn. But look at this, 12% of people who were responded to this said they are undecided. Does that surprise you, Andy? It doesn't surprise me, really. Colorado take a lot of time to think about this, and I think it's a close race. I think they're two good candidates. The thing the difference primarily between these two candidates is one has a record in Congress, one doesn't. Um, and I really think if you look at the ads and you look at how things are, are going for Caraveo right now, she was very active in Congress her first two years. She's got a record to run on. Uh, Gabe, while a viable opponent, I think won't, uh, won't eventually measure up uh, to where Caraveo is going to win. But I think at the end of the day, those 12% are going to go Caraveo because they have a record, they trust her, and they know her. 
Michael, are you surprised that 12 percent of people are undecided, and yet we are about oh, five weeks out or so until well, the election? I'm not because if people vote late uh, in Colorado right now, about 40 percent of people vote the last couple of days. So they think they have a few weeks uh, to figure this out. I do think, you know, having an incumbent who is at 44 percent can't be good uh, for the Democrats right now. It is a tied race. No surprise why millions, tens of millions of dollars are, are coming in. I do think there's three good things for Evans in this poll. One uh, is the fact that the economy is the number one issue. Uh, number two issue is tied for immigration and housing. Uh, I think that's a good thing for him. His favorability is plus 16, where Caraveo's is plus three. Uh, all these ads coming in, spending against Gabe Evans, he still is plus 16 favorability. And then the Libertarian is out, right? They, they, no Libertarian in this race. The last race was 1,600 votes. Kirk Meyer probably would have won if there was no Libertarian. So I think those are things that you got to feel good about if you're Evans, but it's a close race. Okay, so neither of you are surprised by the results. Ballots here in Colorado go out in less than a week now. And as you mentioned, you can't turn on the TV without seeing an ad for either one of the candidates. So I'm wondering, what is it going to be that's going to make people's mind up here and help them decide? Michael. Well, I think for Evans, people need to get to know him better. He's been in the legislature for just one term. Uh, he's not an incumbent in Congress right now. And so I think he needs to play up his military service, his Hispanic heritage. Uh, you know, he just voted to cut property taxes in, in special session. That's a big deal to people. So it's finding what those 12% undecided care about, what issues they care about, really targeting them. There's a lot of money being spent, but how do you get to know the candidate better? Uh, that's what you got to do down the stretch. And Andy, I imagine this has to help Democrats. When you look at, say, two years ago, again, Caraveo won. You you look at also two years ago, Polis won this area by seven. Michael Bennett won it by four. Yeah, we're, we're confident in CD8. Well, it's a very mixed uh, bag in terms of the, you know, the third or third or third in that in that district. That was intentional when we drew it. But I think at the end of the day, that 12 percent that don't know yet how they're going to go will go for the incumbent largely because she has the record. She actually sided with Republicans against Democrats on border issues. Um, and we know that we've watched that uh, with her. And that's obviously in her ad. But also, I think the Gabe Evans negative ads are playing against him. Um, so while he may be plus 16 right now, at the end of the day, I think what happens at the end, you know, people are tired of negative ads. They want to see Caraveo win. Also, choice is a part of this election as well. Electing a physician to Congress makes a lot of sense. Uh, and she obviously has that expertise. So I, I, vote, I think Caraveo wins out. All right, let's move along to the what's being called the Midwestern nice debate between Democrat Tim Walls and Republican J.D. Vance. An overnight survey from CBS News, which also hosted the debate, shows that people were basically evenly divided about who they thought won this. Uh, so the question here, did either candidate do enough or maybe flub enough to sway the undecided voters in the six swing states that are going to decide the presidential election, Michael? I don't think that there is a big change. And we've talked about debates before. I think the vice presidential debate doesn't have a huge impact. Impact. I do think that Vance won the debate. Uh, Walls came across as nervous. He came across as not ready. I am still totally baffled by the fact that Harris did not pick Governor Shapiro when Pennsylvania is going to be uh, the race that matters in terms of this presidential election. Uh, you know, I, it was a very civil debate. Uh, I think both of them increased their favorability. There was a lot more focus on the issues, which I think was important. And when the issues are talked about, again, Republicans do well because the issues are the economy, immigration at the national level, too. And I do think Vance had a very very good point. He said, look, if you're going to talk about all these plans that Harris uh, and Walls want to do, why isn't Harris doing it right now? She's the vice president. You can implement these plans right now. And so I, I don't think it changes the race, but I don't think it, it, it hurt either side. Uh, this race is super, super close. And after the debate, it's still close. Andy, I'll let you jump in here in a second. But just a question on that. Republicans have asked that question a lot. Why hasn't Kamala Harris done all of this the last three years or so? But is there something to be said that she's the vice president and not the president? Uh, maybe, but I, I and mean, that I she think doesn't make the ultimate decision still, on things. I think, it's Joe Biden you know, who Biden's most likely not, does. I, mean, I don't think anybody thinks Joe Biden's making all these decisions right now. But you are a team, right? You're you're running on the record that you have, uh, and so I think it's valid to say what is going on in immigration when you were put in charge of, of immigration policy, and it's horrible right now. What's going on with the economy? So I, I think it's a valid point to say why aren't you doing these things now if you are part of that leadership team. And you want your reaction to the VP debate in a second. But first, that question. You've worked with presidents in the past and currently. D does the president make the decision or does the VP decide all of those things? I mean, I think there's a combination. And I think it's a fair point to say that the vice president has usually the last word in the president's ear when he makes a final decision. I think that's fair to say. I think what in, in, in the debate itself, though, what's interesting is the last part of the debate was the most important part, which is where Vance could not address anything about January 6th. He basically negated everything about tr Trump's culpability in the whole process and couldn't answer whether Trump won or or lost the 2020 election. That in and of itself speaks volumes about J.D. Vance's competency and his ability to evaluate whether he's a good leader or not. And I think what Tim Walz did was provide steady, constant leadership 
as Michael said, the VP debate doesn't make that big a difference, but this one does, particularly because I think the country doesn't know either candidate. Some I've heard on, 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 on networks have said these two actually acted more civilly uh, than Donald Trump did uh, in the debate. And I think and, and you know, I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that J.D. Vance has trouble with his running mate. I think they don't agree on things. I think there's a lot of disparity between their, their answers. And I think there's something that J.D. Vance has to answer for that. He didn't answer it that night. I think what Tim Walls did was say Kamala Harris is the president. When she's the president, I'll be there to support her. I didn't hear J.D. Vance say any of that. And so that's a really big component in a VP debate that we didn't hear from J.D. Vance. I think Walt easily won that debate. And I think at the end of the day, people want civility. And that's what Tim Walz brought. All right. We'll talk about the presidential candidates right after this. Stay there. Well, we're back and we go to the presidential race now. Forget the marathon of a long campaign. It is now a sprint to Election Day as more and more voters get early ballots and are mail-in ballots as well. Aggregate polls show the race to 270 for the Electoral College is as competitive as it gets. Andy Boy and Michael Fields back with me now. I want to talk about what's going on foreign policy right now internationally. The fighting in the Middle East has intensified this week. It's been basically a year since Hamas attacked Israel. Plus, just this week, Iran launched nearly 200 missiles at Israel. Israel. They responded. They say they're going to. And they also launched a ground invasion into Lebanon. I'm curious if this is going to affect who people vote for in the presidential election with a lot going on in the world right now, Andy. Yeah, I think foreign policy will have a particular impact on this race, largely because the president spent a lot of time, uh, particularly in his fourth year in office, trying to get a peace deal done. Um, and it's really sort of spun out of control. So the part that where where the vice president is most vulnerable on foreign policy is this issue. It's not actually Russia um, uh, and Ukraine. It's actually the Middle East right now. And I think as much as we want this solved and as much as it's escalating, the problem for the vice president is that she's carrying some of that baggage from Biden that didn't get this deal done with her in the campaign. And that will add to it. Um, normally, it wouldn't have such a big effect. But I think the fact that it's so aggressive and it's so close to the election perhaps could have an impact on her. And she's got to have an answer for it. I believe she she does. I'm working with her directly, and I think that she'll have an adequate answer, and I think she'll have a substantial answer. More to come on that, but but it does affect uh, just in, in this in this small uh, universe of what happens in the Middle East right now at this time, close to the election, it's affecting. All right, less than a minute, Michael. Yeah, and I think it could in such a close race, and especially in certain swing states. You think about Michigan; there is a divide within the Democratic Party uh, on the Israel issue, and so if you're talking a one or two point race, which a lot of these swing states are, I mean, all seven swing states are within a point and a half right now, right? Anything can impact it. The top two issues are the economy and immigration, but foreign policy could have an impact on this race. We're two points up nationally, however, right now, so that, that's important to keep in mind, too. But does it when it comes down to how <laughs> people does. vote in those swing states? It nationally, does it. doesn't really does reflect well, it, what electoral these states college. go for. It does, yeah. it, it, <laughs> I, I, I would argue it does. Yes. Okay, there you go. We'll leave it at that. Andy Boy and Michael Fields. Gentlemen, thank you so much thank for you. being here. Great discussion, as always. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week right here on Colorado Point of View.